Hey, you lovely lot, and welcome back to Crime Analyst, your go-to real crime, true crime YouTube channel for expert insight and analysis, where I center the victims and I explore the psychology of the perpetrators to inform intervention and prevention. And that's what makes Crime Analyst different. So I want to just firstly start by saying a huge thank you to all of you who have subscribed to Crime Analyst's YouTube channel. I hit 20,000 subs last week, so thank you so much. I really enjoy reading your comments, so keep them coming. And thank you for your super thanks and your donations. It means the world to me. And if you haven't subscribed just yet, what are you waiting for? Hit the button. Okay, so before I get into this week's video, which is about unraveling the latest developments in the Gilgo Beach murders, I want to just give a trigger warning. And that trigger warning is because this material and the cases that I talk about may well be distressing or upsetting. But the reason I talk about cases and I recenter the victims in their narrative is for education purposes and to raise awareness. And it may well just save a life. So that's how important I take this. And also just to say that I'm not diagnosing anyone in the videos. I'm giving my informed expert opinion and insight and analysis. Okay, with that having been said, I want to unravel some of the latest developments that have happened in the Gilgo Beach murders. Now, in my last two videos, I talked about the victims and I also talked about the evidence and some of the key pieces of evidence in the 32 page bail application. So please go back and watch those videos if you haven't done so already. And I talked about the press conference that happened after the first hearing on August the 1st, where Hewerman's lawyer said very clearly that Hewerman had told him that he was innocent. And he also put it to the media that they hadn't even contemplated that the police had the wrong guy in custody. Well, the 32 page bail application really is overwhelming in terms of evidence thus far. And there is more evidence. And the more evidence comes from 12 days of searching his property, of taking it apart and finding the vault while well, in the ground, built to a specification with a steel door. And I do just want to say, a few of you have said when I mentioned that it was soundproof, well, it wasn't specifically soundproofed. Well, what do you think it's going to be when it's underground, built in concrete with a steel door. That on its own would render it pretty soundproof, okay? So I'm not gonna split hairs on this, it's just a fact that that was intentional and it wasn't just a vault that had guns in it. It wasn't just about a gun safe, it was bigger than that. And there were other items within that area. And when we think about the serial killer in terms of this particular type of perpetrator and the binding and the sadism. This is an individual who will want to spend time with the victims. Okay, so it's really important the areas, storage units and the vault and other areas that are found, the South Carolina uh, property or grounds that he had. It's really important that South Carolina, his connections there and in Las Vegas, where he had a timeshare, all these areas need to be searched. And the first generation avalanche is on its way back from South Carolina to New York to be processed. There's a huge amount of evidence to be processed now, and that will take time. So all of that will happen in the, in the background. So this really is a forward moving investigation and it happens this way often at the point of charge because then you timeline someone and then other areas, other anchor points become relevant and all of these things need to be looked at and analysed and assessed. So I'm sure that his defence team will probably go for a speedy trial and they have a lot of information to go through themselves as does the prosecution. But things like, as I mentioned before, the burner phone, seven burner phones tied to various fictitious named Tinder accounts and one of those burner phones being in his possession and the fact that phone calls that were made from either the burner phone or Melissa Bartholomew's phone, for example, were in the same location as Rex Heuermann's phone. 
So these things are really important when we think about the evidence that ties him into this case. And therefore, that 32-page bail application really does highlight overwhelming evidence, in my opinion. And then, of course, you've got the 290-odd guns um, that were seized from his address. And only some of them had uh, licenses, firearm licenses. So that tells me he doesn't play by the rules. And of course, that's what he was spending his money on and on prostitutes and on himself, not on his family. So one of the things that is new that I do want to share with you is that Asa, his wife, was using food stamps. So whilst he's spending these hundreds of thousands of dollars on firearms for him, his wife is using food stamps. So this for me is instructive. And financial abuse, economic abuse, the withholding of funds, that is part often of coercive control. So I'm looking for what key behaviours might be instructive to point to coercive control, and that's one of them, particularly when we think about the fact that this is an affluent area. So that's why the house stands out, that it's dilapidated. There's no love, care or attention that's gone into it. The wooden planks of wood that are holding up the porch, he doesn't value that. When he's an architect, and he should, right? That's his selling point. The fact no one knows them, no one really knows them. That isolation, was that of his doing? Was that intentional? So again, what are the things that are known for sure in this case? And the August the 1st hearing was important. 2,500 pages of documentation of evidence was handed over to the defence. And there was also a press conference called on August the 4th. And I want to talk about that. It was called at short notice by the district attorney, Ray Tierney. We didn't know what was going to be said. And it's quite unusual for these press conferences to keep happening. Normally, DAs keep their powder dry, as we say, and they don't like to say too much. But this was to announce that the task force had identified one of the victims. Now, there were a number of Jane Doe victims, and I don't like even using that term. At New Scotland Yard, even when someone was unidentified and not known, like the torso in the Thames that was found, my boss, the head of homicide, gave him a name and called him Adam. And I think it's important that we do that to humanise victims. So I'm really glad that this victim now has a name, and her name is Karen Vergata. And she was a mother of two, a mother of a toddler when she disappeared on Valentine's Day in 1996. Now, that's important as well. And for me, and oftentimes a date can be significant. And for me, now Rex Heumann's in custody, of course, they will be timelining him. And I hope that they will be looking at that date specifically to ask who he was with, to ask those who knew him, his partner, was he with them? Because oftentimes with Valentine's Day, partners are together celebrating. So you have to go far back, much further than 2010 in this case. And as I mentioned, it was on Valentine's Day when Karen disappeared, she wasn't reported missing. And something very important was shared with me by Richard McCann on my Crime Analyst podcast series when I was deconstructing the murders in Yorkshire back in the 70s that were committed by a very prolific serial killer called Peter Sutcliffe. And he told me that the misogyny and the judgment towards his mother, Wilma, and the other victims was just so disgusting and it made him angry. And I shared with him it made me angry too. The misogyny, the fact that the, there wasn't urgency to the investigation because it was just prostitutes who were being killed. Well, he said that his mother worked hard to put food on the table for him and his siblings and the that was important to remember because the fathers were no longer in the picture. They had disappeared and they're not the ones that are being blamed or judged. It's the women who are. So that again tells me about this double standard. And I think it's really important that we understand that, that when often when women sell their bodies, it's because they're trying to put food on the table for themselves and or for their children. So Karen was 34 years old at the time she disappeared, but what I will tell you is she looked much younger. And it was her legs that were found, first of all, in April 1996, and then her skull was found 15 years later. So this is a 27-year cold case. And finally, a name has been given 
to what was called Fire Island Jane Doe. And that's an important part of this investigation. And I wonder whether she would have been identified far earlier on had there been an investigation, but she hadn't been reported missing. So the district attorney, Ray Tierney, said at the press conference that he wanted to honour the victims. And I think that's very important because they haven't been honoured thus far. And let's not forget that 11 bodies were found and that they were just stumbled upon. This wasn't part of an active investigation. Sorry, I get very animated. I'm hitting my mic because I see this far too often that serial killers are stumbled upon rather than it's an active process. And the same with finding them. But I'll come on to that because we have to remember that Rex Hewerman was identified through old information and intelligence given by a significant witness in the case of Amber Costello. Now, that significant witness was someone called Dave Schaller. And yes, he was her pimp. And yes, he saw... Rex Hewerman, what he described the, the day before of this six foot four to six foot six ogre of a man. And he gave the description of this guy with an empty gaze, this huge ogre, and he was driving a first generation avalanche. So that information wasn't followed up on. It wasn't prioritised. And this is part of the problem. And I talked about it in my last video. I nudged onto it by saying that because some of the victims were prostitutes, they weren't seen as worthy victims. And there was a lack of urgency in the investigation. Now, a couple of you have written saying, well, that's not the case. But I want to share with you my knowledge and experience of working these cases. And it most often is the case. And the misogyny that I've experienced, and I've seen firsthand where women are not valued and not seen as worthy and that does play a part and I want to share a quote from what the chief of detectives said in 2012 at a press conference when he said that the consolation was that the murderer was not selecting victims at large but rather selecting from a pool. Now what the subtext is for that is that it's just women and vulnerable women who are being targeted, nothing to see here, nothing to be worried about. That's the subtext. So I can tell you categorically that that played a role and it set a tone and victims are seen, they're weighed up of who's worthy and who's not. And often women and children are not seen as worthy and the patriarchy and the old boys network plays a part. That's why Violent men are allowed to carry on being violent and a serial killer like this has continued for far too long because key information and evidence and intelligence from significant witnesses was overlooked. And it was also overlooked because there was a lot of infighting going on within the police and with the DA's office as well. Now, a lot of the detectives were very upset. There was almost a mutiny. They were so upset. The lead and longtime detective on this case was removed by the district attorney and that caused a lot of upset. His name was Patrick Portella and that created a lot of upset. And they also felt that they were being micromanaged by the district attorney and they didn't like that either. And I can tell you detectives do not like being told what to do. And so in this area, there was a lot of infighting, a lot of politics at play but also corruption. And I want to talk about the chief police who was someone called James Burke, who somehow managed to find his way climbing through the ranks and became the chief, even though he had been using prostitutes. And that was known and that was documented. And remember, this is a very small area. Everyone knows everyone. This kind of information people know about. And yet there he was, the chief of police, setting that tone about what's important and what's not. And apparently, and I've heard it from multiple people on the ground, he craved sex, power and control. And there he was heading up this investigation into the murders of prostitutes. And he also ended up being arrested and convicted. And he was sentenced to 46 months in a federal prison because a man had broken into his truck and stolen his bag of that contained pornography and sex toys. And then he went and found that individual who was in custody and he beat him up. And then he wanted to cover that up and asked numerous 
police officers and detectives to cover it up and not to say anything. And District Attorney Thomas Spota, Burke was his protege. He assisted in covering it up and it did all come out. And he ended up being sentenced to 46 months, which for me doesn't seem long enough given this huge abuse of power and corruption and public confidence issue. And then you had Spota being sentenced to five years. And I would imagine there's a lot more that was going on, a lot more. That's just scraping the surface, in my opinion, when I understand these cases and what's happened. So that's what was going on within Suffolk County Police Department. That's what they were spending their time and energy on. And in fact, some have even said they spent all their time trying to cover up what was going on, not investigating and prioritizing these murders. And that should not be something that's glossed over. The investigation was stalled because of this. The District Attorney Thomas Spota and the Police Chief James Burke did not want the FBI involved. They were invited in once and my intel was that they were given key pieces of information that they could read and they were read information from the case file, but they weren't allowed access to the crime scene, to the case file, to all of that information, and therefore their hands were tied. And of course, they didn't want the FBI coming in asking difficult questions. They could have lost their jobs and that's what they were trying to protect. They were trying to protect themselves. It didn't matter to them that a serial killer and possibly a number of killers were out there killing women. No, that didn't matter to them. And that's what we have to remember here because women have to matter more. This was about corruption and an abuse of power. It's about male egos, the patriarchy and the old boys network. And we can't just say, well, that's in the rear view mirror and that's not relevant. It's absolutely relevant and women deserve better. Enough is enough. True accountability and transparency needs to happen. So I'm going to end by just reiterating, I do think the task force have done a great job, but this really isn't the time for a victory lap. There's a huge amount of work still to do in this case. So it's a time to remain circumspect, to honour the victims. And the way that you do that is to investigate fully and to identify the victims. And it's really important that they invest in the investigation because let's face it, the task force, well, within two months, they found Rex Heuerman. They did their job. And as I always say, do your damn job and the rest will follow. And that's what the public want to see. So I'm going to end there thinking about the victims and there'll be more to come on this case. I have no doubt. More in terms of the evidence, more in terms of the investigation. Um, we already know that Rex Heuerman will not give a confirmation swab. And that's a very interesting development, given that you would think that if he were innocent, that he would want to do that. So... That again is another red flag for me, but I'm gonna end with us thinking about the victims. And also just to let you know that Melissa Moore has set up a GoFundMe for Asa and for the children. They really are um, destitute. Their house was ripped apart in the searches and Melissa and Kerry Ross and Dennis Raider's daughter knows exactly what it's like to be in their shoes. And there is a GoFundMe. So if you would like to assist with that, I'll put the link in the description below. So I'm going to end there thinking about the victims. And I do include Asa and the children in that. Until next time, be curious, ask questions and always trust your instincts.